This is the Stock Trend Reality Podcast, episode 156. A lot of times I'll look back and I'm like, you know, I didn't screw up my analysis. I was just wrong. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. And this is your host, a great way he's discovered to relax, brush his daughter's hair, Clay Trader. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just because it's a methodical process that's not very difficult to not be good at. Um, but it, just brushing my, my girl's hairs, hairs, hair, hair, brushing my girl's hair. Good thing it's not speaking in proper English grammar because I would be really bad at that. But brushing my girl's hair is apparently just very soothing. And if you are a, a dad, I, don't go up to a little girl, please, on the street and be like, hey, I, I'm really stressed out and start brushing her hair. Don't do that, okay? I mean, that's like a lawsuit getting written all over it, probably black guy from the girl's dad. So don't do that. But if you are a dad of some uh, you know, girls, then yeah, give try brushing their hair. I mean, it is it is very, very relaxing. And maybe that's just me, but hey, I I, I never proclaim to be normal at all. But that would be something that I would uh, recommend trying if you have access to it. But again, nowhere did you hear nor did I advise you to walk up to strangers on the street and start brushing their hair. Don't do that. Now, let's see. This is throwing me off for a little bit because usually Chez would hop in right now, but there is no Chez. Chez is currently becoming the Terminator. He's getting some like bionic eyeballs. Actually, it's LASIK surgery, but I, I don't I think becoming the Terminator sounds a whole lot better. But Chez recently got LASIK surgery. He's kind of in recovery mode right now. So he is not with us for this uh, for this episode, so it's just me and guests from the uh, community. MJ is his alias that he goes by. Mike is his name. For those of you that have been part of the community for a while, then I'm sure you've seen MJ at least at one point or the other. He's in there quite a bit, but he is uh, a faithful webinar viewer. He's been around for a long time, and he discusses a pretty big journey that he's been on and one that a lot of good stuff occurs that we can all learn from. And now he's at a current spot now where he's doing a lot of, a lot of good stuff. And when you kind of just sit back and let him talk, yeah, he's, he's come a long way and he says a lot of stuff that makes a whole lot of sense. So without further ado, let's get to speaking with Mike and hearing all about his journey. Mike, welcome to the show. Howdy, howdy. Now, it, it may slip... Because I'm so used to MJ, MJ. So will you you'll you you will still reply to MJ, or do you want me to call you MJ, or should I stick with Mike? Hey, either one. Okay. I mean, anybody online calls me MJ, so I, I'll, I'll reply to either. All right. I, I'm gonna try to stick with Mike, but I'm trying to think now because, like I said, MJ. In, in my mind, MJ is kind of just like a staple of the community. I'm, I'm just used to seeing your avatar. I'm used to seeing your screen name in the chat room. So not to jump too far ahead of your story or anything, but how long have you been a member of the community? Uh, that's, that's actually kind of funny. It was October 26th of 2016 is when I joined. And the reason I know the exact date is because it was my wife's birthday. And so that was kind of her birthday gift <laughs> was me buying CTU. <laughs> and then as I'm like 20 minutes into the first robotic trading video, she calls me. She blew out a tire on the way home from church. So I had to shut it down and go change her tire in the middle of the highway for. Oh, I can see how you would remember that date. But uh, so, yeah, happy birthday to you from your wife on her birthday. Is, is, that's pretty, <laughs> yes. I will just say this publicly. Like that, I like yeah. your wife. Your wife sounds like a fantastic lady. So, I mean, my, I think my wife is awesome, man. <laughs> I, I, from the little I know, that sounds like she's uh She's she's a keeper, Mike. She's a keeper. But all right, so th that would make sense. You have been around the community for a long time, um, and I know bits and pieces. I'm going to try my best to play as dumb as possible because I know we've emailed over the years and and stuff like that. But I, you know, I, I feel like I just still un just have not a surface deep understanding of uh, where you stand. So let's get the party started. I mean, where did all this start for you? Where did you first hear about the markets? And what got you interested enough to the point where you 
not necessarily threw in real money, but really started to highly consider, yeah, I, I want to get more hands on with real money. Um, you know, I mean, normal kind of 401k stuff. I was, I was never hands on with it there, but one summer I was visiting my grandparents and my grandfather actually trades and he was, he was in the commodities at the time. And that, it kind of piqued my interest a little bit at the time, but I never, you know, took any kind of action on it. I was, I don't know, I was 18 or 19 at the time, you know, so I, I was more concerned with going to college and things like that. Uh, and then Let's see. Around 2012 or 13, he had mentioned something about the system he was using and how effective it was. And uh, he said he could he could kind of teach me how to do it and that eventually it could replace my income. So, of course, I heard replace my income. I can quit my job and I'm working at home, you know, so (laughs) that's that's kind of where it started at. Let me ask let me ask you this, because you I I always love when family members are, are trading. So, I mean, he was a commodities trader as in he was doing it all online or was he doing stuff? Because you said your grandfather. So, I mean, or was, is he doing the stuff old school over the phone? I mean, was he on the floor of some exchange? I mean, what exactly was he, how was he, you know, trading the commodities being your grandfather? So, obviously, a little bit older in years, but how was all that kind of unfolding for him? Because I'm just totally curious. Yeah, he was doing it all online at the time. Um all the ins and outs of it, I'm not really aware of. Cause like I said, it was just kind of, I found it interesting that he was doing it. Cause you know, cause you can make a lot of money. Um, so I found it interesting in that aspect, but I never really kind of got into it and, and researched it or anything until, uh, probably three, three, four years ago, something like that. Okay. So it's, it sounds like he was doing it maybe like at, in retirement. It's not like he was doing it for a career because I mean, as a career, he yeah. would have been doing it way before online even existed. Right. Right, right. Yeah. He he actually had his own company, which he later sold. Um, so he was well off anyway. And so that was kind of, it was something interesting to him, kind of a hobby at first. Um, uh, frankly, it still is. <laughs> but he's, uh, I mean, he's retired now, sold his business. And um, so that's just kind of what he does with his time now. Okay. All right. That makes sense. I thought he was, you know, he did it as a career. So he was back in like the olden days of calling, you know, just however they did it back then. But that makes sense. He sold his company felt, hey, you know what, I, I want to still keep my brain engaged somehow, and he chose uh, commodities trading to do all that. So awesome. So, I mean, uh, the, the system, he mentioned it, like you said, replacing income, that got your antennas to, to stand up like I think anybody would, and he, he was going to teach it to you. So, I mean, I, I guess let's pick things up from there. What was the system? What, you know, how did it all kind of, how did the system work, and then how did it all work out for you? Uh, well, <laughs> spoiler alert, it didn't work out very well. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and I'm not going to even blame the system. It was more, it, it was more a fact that I, I couldn't, I couldn't emotionally handle the risk that the, that, that the system came with. It was because the thing is, I, you know, I, I knew nothing about the markets. I'd never traded, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't know what an online broker was. I, I knew nothing. Um, but I started watching these videos of, of the guy, you know, going over the system and, of course, showing 80, 90 percent winning trades. And, you know, as long as but to, to its credit, it had rules and, and, and hard targets and stops and things like that. But as someone who had never been into the markets. I had no idea what I was doing, and it it, it required it was a it was a futures. It was scalping futures, NQ and crude oil and things like that. And so for somebody who had never traded, didn't know anything, jumping, jumping with both feet in, scalping futures on a 250 tick chart, it, it didn't work out so great, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I mean, talk about, I'm trying to think of an analogy off the top of my head for, for listeners out there, but that's pretty much, uh, you know, what, what Mike did was he picked up this thing called, yeah, this is a baseball bat, okay? And then, yeah, up there, that's like home plate where, I, yeah, okay, that's where I'm supposed to stand. Okay, I'm going to go stand there with my baseball bat, and then all of a sudden, he's facing some major league pitcher that's throwing 95 miles an hour. That's pretty much what Mike did in terms of being brand new and then jumping into scalping futures, 250 ticks. I mean, all that stuff. It was just learning to what a baseball bat is to all of a sudden, you know, playing in the big leagues. Is that that's probably a fair analogy, isn't it, Mike? Would you agree? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. And 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 truth be told, 
um, the first few trades that I put on with live money, they won. You know, I followed the rules, I followed the system, and they won. Uh, the problem was, and and it, it started to click after I I got the audio book trading in the zone. It started to click anytime a, a trade would go against me, especially if I if I you know if it was a realized loss. It, as you say, I, I failed the dentist chair the dentist chair test. I would all I, you know I'd, my palms would sweat. I'd get nervous and. <laughs> I, I couldn't emotionally handle those losses. So if I'd get three or four wins, that was great. But then if I had one or two losses, I, I'd shut it down for two or three weeks and I wouldn't trade because I was like, I don't trust the system anymore. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, you already, you said it perfectly early on when you said, you know, you're not going to blame the system, but you couldn't handle the risk that the system brought aboard. And that's going to send me off on a little miniature rant here, but we talk about it all the time, and this is why, and I'm not saying that this guy uh, you know, was a scumbag or anything like this, but anybody, well, I don't know, because any, if you are teaching a quote-unquote system, then you should know that that is disingenuous because a system is, is going to, you know, it, sure, maybe it really does work for one person. Maybe it works for other people, but not everybody is going to be you know, their, their personal risk tolerance, their emotional comfort levels are not going to always jive with a system that somebody's selling you. So that's why I always say you got to be very, very leery of anybody that's selling a system because sure, it may work and I've used this before and I'm going to use it again. Let's say somebody's selling you a system on how to have fun and their system is to have fun, you need to go skydiving. You need to go deep sea you know, snorkeling under caves. You need to, you know, I don't know, just do crazy stuff like that. And you're thinking, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. My, my sense of fun is curling up by the fire and reading a book. Again, is that person's system wrong? No, maybe for some people it does work jumping out of airplanes. But that's what, that's what I mean by personal risk tolerance. And as Mike beautifully summarized, yeah, he's not going to throw the system under the bus per se, but he just didn't personally fit into the system because of that whole risk factor. And that's why, you know, Chez and I talk about it all the time. Be very, very careful of somebody just selling a system because sure, it may work for them, but is it going to work for you? Well, I don't know. That all depends on your kind of personal risk tolerances. So, I mean, how long did, and I, I, I should know, I'm trying to understand. So you take like, let's just say three winning trades, four winning trades, and then a losing trade or two would come. Were those losing trades wiping out all your gains or or no? I wouldn't say all of them. Um, but for example, a winning trade would be X amount of points on an NQ chart for say 60 bucks or something. And then a losing trade, you know, would be 80 bucks. So after a while, I, I was kind of like, this this doesn't make any sense. I, I, I have to win two to cover up one loss and it doesn't even... You know, it's it wasn't even like a one to one risk risk reward risk reward, and it just eventually it was kind of like this doesn't make any sense to me. I don't I don't like the way this is going. Um, right, right. So because I was then- I was under it, it put me under pressure to to win like every trade. It's like I you know sure I mean this you know and, and frankly it was just you know it was some package up uh, you know moving averages and stuff like that kind of your typical system that somebody would sell, but I I didn't know any better and. But like I said, it was just I was under so much pressure to win every trade that I made because one loser would wipe away, you know, one and a half trades. And so that 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 didn't that didn't work out very well for me. That's yeah, I was just going to say it sounds like, you know, based on the math that you were describing, I'm not going to say, uh, you know, that it, it won at work. But very clearly, given the math, it is a high win rate required strategy in order for the math to work out and. I can totally understand, especially, I mean, remember, listeners, the context here is Mike is brand new. So brand new, it just keeps getting better and better. Scalping interday futures where now you have to win a high percentage amount of the time. Uh, like you said, it didn't end up working well or didn't end up working out for you. How long did this all last before you finally said, you know what, I, I, I'm going to just, I, I'm done with this strategy? Um. Probably close to three years, and the thing really? is, I wasn't Whoa, lying. three years. Yeah. Whew, I was not. Ex- <laughs> I was thinking three weeks, maybe three months. No. Three years. Well, that caught me off guard. Okay. Well, see, here's the thing: is I was very patient about it because, like I said, I would lose a few trades and then win. I, it's kind of weird. I wasn't like in a rush to make a million dollars. I just wanted to kind of make some supplemental income at first, and I paper traded and paper traded and paper traded and paper traded. 
However, I was lying to myself the entire time I paper traded because, you know, I, I would I would start at the far right edge and kind of go tick by tick and say, OK, there's the signal. I'm in at this price. And then I'd go and go and go. And then it would be a loser. And I'd say, wow. And, and kind of I'd look in retrospect and be like, man, you know, right there, I, I broke a rule getting in that trade. I would never break one of my rules when I put real money on the line. So I'm not going to count that one. And then two uh-huh. trades later. I love yeah. it. This, <laughs> listeners, this is great stuff. This is the and, stuff where, what do you mean? Oh, man, this is great. Yeah, keep on going. But please pay attention. This is exactly how the human mind works and why, how do I make all this money paper trading? And then all of a sudden with real money, everything goes to crap. Yeah. Great and stuff well, here. So, yeah, keep that, it up, man. That, this is good. That's why some of like a lot of your YouTube and, and podcast stuff really appeal to me because I'm sitting there. I'm like, is this guy spying on me? That's exactly the stuff I've been doing this entire time. And so, like I said, I'd, 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 I'd get a loser and then I would lie to myself and say, well, that's that's a rule break. I would never do that. And then I would turn around two or three trades later, you know, on my paper trading. I'd have a winner, but the winner was an obvious rule break. And I'm like, well, I mean, that's a winner. That's a good trade. I mean, I mean, it, it was one of those things to where by the time I was done paper trading, I was so shell shocked that I couldn't pull the trigger on live trades because I'm like, I would get one loser and then I would see a perfect setup, you know, another trade later and I wouldn't take it because I'd say to myself, well, I've seen that exact setup lose before, even though it, it lined up perfectly with the rules. And then I'd let three, four, five perfect setups go by. They'd all win. Then I'd take a bad setup because I'd say to myself, well, I've seen that setup work before in the past and it would lose. And I'm like, it, it was just one of those things. I just, I kept, you know, I would break my rules, break my rules, break my rules, and just continually lie to myself that, you know, it, it, it was, it was, it wasn't going to happen when I put real money on the line. And as you know, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's not, not how it goes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let me ask this. When you were doing your paper trading, did, were you aware that you were breaking your rules and kind of fudging things? Or is this just all you talking in hindsight? Um, Kind of. It was like I said, it was one of those things. I mean, I have I had a notebook. I had, you know, Excel spreadsheets. I had tons and tons of data, but but it was all false. And and that was the thing is, you know, I'd tell myself, I'd say I'd go back and say, OK, let's do this again. So every signal I'm taking, whether whether I whether I quote unquote feel like I should or not, because it's you know, if you're going to follow your system and your rules, you need to take the trades and not pick and choose you know, well, I'm going to take this one and not that one because you don't really get a true gauge of, of how the system is performing at that point. Um, and, and I just I just kept doing it over and over. And one day I was just like, you know what, man, I'm done. Uh, I'm done with this. This isn't working. Just sitting here and I don't know, I, 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 I'm not, I have no data, but I, I think, I think I would argue if this was a court of law that subconsciously you did know during your paper trading that you were breaking rules and you did know that it was just, you were not behaving. Because I think when you went with live, that I think that's a lot of the he- where a lot of the hesitation was maybe coming from was your subconscious saying, Mike, you know, dude, that wasn't the best paper trade and you kind of lied quite a bit, you know? And like I said, I don't, I don't know if that was the case, but in my mind, I think that would make sense on maybe why you struggled so much actually going live was because somewhere in the, the deep, dark crevices of your, of your mind, um, maybe, maybe those voices knew that you weren't exactly being honest, but I don't know. Very fascinating though. That's, that's fascinating stuff. And Mike, he's not a psychopath. He's not an idiot. He's, oh, I would never do that when paper trading. Okay. All right. New listener. Don't, don't heed our warning. Go ahead. You go do your own thing. You do it your way. You'll notice, uh, the human mind is a very tricky place when it wants you to think that you can make money at doing something that you really want to make money at doing. So I will just leave it at that. But yeah, that, that's some good stuff there. So three oh, yeah. years. I mean, I'd, I'd agree with you, man. I mean, the proof was in the pudding. I mean, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a coincidence that, you know, all my paper trades won and then, you know, 50, you know 40 or 50% of my live trades lost. It was, you know, I mean, that told me, hey, you know, Either you're just picking bad trades when you're when you're going live, or you're just flat out lying to yourself when you're paper trading. It's got to be one of the two. Yeah, no, a- absolutely. That's and um, like I said, if you've never traded or never paper traded, you think oh, I would never do any of that. Just like I said, heed or warning, or go do your own thing. You'll you'll learn very very quickly. So this goes on for three years. So timeline wise, what where are we talking? 
2016 then when you finally stop or I mean where did where are we at timeline? Um yeah, cuz it was probably around uh I'd say late December of uh of 2014 when I kind of, you know, started you know looking at the system and reviewing it and things like that and then like I said it was October 2017 when I when I got CTU. And I'll be honest, I, I still hadn't used, I still hadn't quit using the system at that point. I still wasn't trading live with it, but I still was testing it because, you know, like I said, I mean, whether the system was a scam or whatever, I mean, when I looked, it was, you know, hey, when, when I follow those rules to the T, it worked out more often than not. Um, yeah, I just couldn't handle the, handle the risk. And truth be told, I still have the system. It's still on my computer. And I've actually adjusted it since to, you know, to fit my risk, but I, I mean, I, I, I'm still not using it, but so yeah, it was, it was, like I said, it was probably, probably December of 2014. And then, like I said, October, 2016. So probably closer to two years, I guess, maybe, maybe not quite three. Okay. So you joined in October of 2016. I, I, I think you misspoke because originally, originally you said 2016, but then you just said you joined CTU in th- October, 2017, but I'm assuming you meant October of 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. It's 2016. Sorry. I'm, okay. All right. I just want to make sure. But so, I mean, yeah, the, no, God, I'm sorry. Go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was, I was just going to say, I'm because so, I was so used to saying last year I joined, but I keep forgetting it's 2018 now. So. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, I, I can, uh, I can see that. So you, um, where did you? I mean, do you want to fill in any gaps? Where did in terms of where you, you know, before you eventually stumbled upon, uh, you know, clay trader stuff, or, or I mean, if, if if there's no gaps to fill, then my question would be, you know, where did you first come across, you know, clay trader stuff? Well, yeah, and that was the other thing is the way I found you was because I was looking for something because I knew, you know, again, not being able to accept the risk. I knew there was something I wasn't doing right. I just didn't know what it was. Like you say, you don't know what you don't know. So I started looking on YouTube and listening to podcasts and things. And I'm like, there is something that I'm not doing right because I'm I'm failing bad at this. And this is supposed to be such a straightforward, easy winning system and all this. And you know, I probably lost about 20% of my account doing it. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I ran across one of your videos on YouTube one day, I think. And uh, from there, I just kind of started watching the videos. And I actually went into my um, podcast and searched, you know, Clay Trader. I was like, I wonder if this guy has a podcast. And so I started listening to the podcast from episode one. I've probably listened to, I don't know about all of them, but I've listened to probably most of them, though. Uh, kind of random, but do you have a favorite one just out of pure curiosity, or do you have one that really stands out? Um, Patty, I think I think Patty's two part episode was great. Yeah, I, I, that would. I, I'll go. I'll go back and listen to that one, I'll, and I'll just cry laughing. That was a, that was a, he's he was so energetic, man. That was a good one. Yeah, I I think he. I don't think anybody has been quite as energetic as he has, but uh, I. I can see why that one, and I would understand why that one uh, stood out to you. So do you, yeah. Ah, oh, there, no, there's no, one thing I, I, I left like out. I, there's one thing I left out that I just remembered that you're going to like a lot. You're, you're going to love this all part. All right, good. Um, going back to the not being able to handle, once I realized I wasn't able to handle the risk of, of what the system offered, I decided it was because my account size wasn't big enough to take on the type of risk that I was taking. So, Oh, here we and, go. Yeah. <laughs> In order to increase that account size, I took a loan on my 401k to increase my trading oh, account. Oh, here we go. <laughs> now, now before you kill me too bad, the the, the I'm the, not going to kill you. You'll probably kill yourself. Or I, you <laughs> clearly know that this was not smart, so I don't think there's anything I need to add on here. Yeah. Now, the the, the only saving grace was the, the, the interest on the loan was like 4.5%, but I basically pay it back to myself, back into my 401k, so it wasn't like I'm losing money, but still. I wouldn't recommend anyone taking a loan on your four hundred one k to put in a to put into a trading system that you don't believe in. Would you recommend anybody take a loan on anything to trade? No, 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 not, no, not at all. Why? Why would you say that? I real I know you know the answer, but for listeners out there, because maybe they're thinking, "Oh, wait a second, so he didn't technically lose any money," and he said, "But why? Why would you say? You know what? From what you've learned now in your in your multiple years." Why would you advise somebody listening that may be now contemplating doing some sort of loan? What would you tell that person? Well, because if you, if, you, if you don't, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's cliche, you know, only trade using risk capital, but you never really understand what risk capital is until you start to trade. It's like, if, if I can't afford to put this money in the trash can and light it on fire, then I can't afford to trade with it. And so when you take a loan, said. 
it, when you take a loan, then you have to pay that loan back, right? And so every day, every day that you go to place a trade, you're, you're going to say, well, I need to make X amount of dollars to pay this loan back. And then, the, and then the loan is X amount percentage. So I need to make that much more on top of it. And it's, it's just going to lead to you forcing things and making foolish, uh, foolish decisions in your trading. And it's just, it's not going to go well. Yeah. And, and then, you know, God forbid you have a losing trade. So now the mind goes down the rabbit hole of, oh crap. So now I'm in the hole this amount. So that means I got to do the, and your, and your math, and your mind starts doing the math. And then you realize, okay, and then I got to do that much and make, and it's just, it gets messy very, very quickly. So Mm -hmm. yes, shame on you for doing the loan. But like you said, you know, it worked out. That's good. But you would you would never do it again, right? Is is that a safe assumption on my part? Not at all. Like, yeah, no, not a chance. Good, good. So you, um, I guess, so you you were able to pay back the loan, but when you, how long would that was that loan outstanding before you finally got it paid back? Oh, I mean, it's I'm still paying it. They just kind of pull it out of my check and put it in my four hundred one k every month. So, okay, all right, yeah. but you're you're not using any of that money to trade. No, 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 no. Okay. So the loan is outstanding still, but you're not using any of that as risk capital. Right. Yeah. The, the, the loan just, it, it, it just, it goes into my 401k every single paycheck. Okay. All right. I, I just want to make sure that I didn't mishear something. And then here, all of a sudden you are still trading with some sort of form of a loan risk capital, but you are not. So, okay. Crisis averted. So you, I'm trying to think. Because I try to pride myself, but ah, yeah, the the emails are getting. Did you join Inner Circle first, and then Clay Trader University, or did you just do the whole kit and caboodle at once? What was that whole sequence? Yeah, no, I just jump jump straight in. Um, because because like I said, I'd watched some of your YouTube videos, and then I got onto the podcast. And uh, going back to Patty's podcast, I heard him say how you know he had joined and got a couple courses, and then he wanted to buy CTU, and you he wasn't getting the refund for the courses he had purchased because you give, you know, you, you, you feel like the benefit should go to those who are willing to take the risk. So when it came time for me to dis- finally decide, I was like, okay, I, c- I can pay the hundred dollars and see what this thing's all about, but I know I'm not going to get it back. So I was like, I'm just going to get the whole thing. And I, I'd, I'd had some email correspondence with Chez, uh, and I was, you know, I, I was waiting until, uh, some things were settled and then I had the extra money to get it. Um, cause I had refinanced my house right around that time. And that's when I had, you know, some extra money available. So I talked to my wife, going back to my wife, I said, I was like, you know, what I'm doing is not working. Um, I found this guy that seems genuine. I, I trust what he has to say. And I, I'd like to buy his course. And she was like, how much? I said, $2,000. And she kind of looked at me. She's like, if you think that's going to be what you need, then go for it. She's like, I'm, I'm all in with you. So do what we got to do. So that's when I pulled the trigger. Dang. I, yeah, your wife gets better and better. So let me ask this. So have you always been an open line of communication with your wife and all this and, and your trading since you've started? Yeah, she doesn't really care too much about it, you know. Um, <laughs> so, But but if she if she asks about it, I tell her she just, you know, she'll sometimes she'll say, how how's it going? Or sometimes I just offer up information. But I mean, she she knows after my experience with the last year, she knows it's, it's not, she knows I'm not putting this in the poor house. You know what I mean? Like she's, she, she, she knows I'm taking it super, super slow. So she's, she's kind of surprised when I tell her if, if I made some trades, you know? Okay. All right. And I just bring that up because it sounds like you and your wife have good communication. And what I'm trying to convey here to, to listeners is remember if you're, if you're jumping into this trading thing, please, please. I'm not saying you have to walk your significant other through every little detail because like Mike, and I can attest to my wife, their eyes would probably roll back in their head and they would just say, oh, that's great, honey. I don't know what you're talking about. But just don't ever try to do anything behind their anybody's back. And I, I think that because Mike, and maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm wrong here, but I think it's a safe assumption, a logical conclusion to think that because you were always... Uh, you know, you're always communicating with your wife that when you did communicate more that, hey, I, I think this system would work. I think this, you know, this program that this guy named Clay is selling, it sounded like she totally trusted you. And my guess would be the trust was coming from the fact that you've always communicated with her and not done anything behind her back. Is Would you 
agree that maybe that's where some of that trust is coming from, just based on the fact that it's not like you're you're, you're trying to hide anything from her. Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, we I mean, we have zero issue telling each other anything that we need to say. So. Awesome. Awesome. So, yeah, just quick little relationship advice there. Uh, and I'm not even trying to be funny. If you are going to do trading, you, you can't do this stuff behind your you know significant other's back. Be an open book. Be full uh, in full communication because um, it is a team effort for sure. You need some sort of supporting cast. You don't want to go this uh, go this uh, go this road alone. So let's see. Your wife green lines it green lights it. You buy it. You're 20 minutes into watching robotic trading. You got to go change that tire on your wife's birthday. And I, I guess from there, where did it go? Because you mentioned you still had that system. I mean, were you still trading with real money, or did you totally, you know, tap the brakes on everything as you started to go through the content that comes uh, with the university program? Well, I was. It, it was, you know, and and I don't know if you remember any, any of my history in the chat room originally, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I know Hooch kind of messed with me a little bit, saying. You know, I was drinking from a fire hose, which was the case. I mean, I, I went through CTU in maybe two or three months, and with oh yeah, with, big time. Yeah, with the uh, even though I, I had the initial plan, I was like, I'm going to go through this thing, and then I'm going to go back and kind of, you know, really, which probably wasn't the best idea, but that's kind of how it happened. So, um, I mean, I've probably gone through robotic trading two or three times, skill sharpening two or three times, and then you know, I'm even I'm going back through RVR and, and shorting courses now and things like that. Um, but at the time, I was I still had that system, and like I said, it, it, it in the back of my mind, I wasn't like I, I don't trust the system because I, I've seen when I follow those rules that it worked, but still I couldn't follow the rules because it was too much money, and so I probably made I don't know maybe two or three more trades with it, and that's kind of kind of like I said, that's when I was like, you know what, nope, no more. I was like, I'm just gonna stop altogether and figure out where to go from here. I'm gonna go through the courses, I'm gonna learn how to do this right, and then figure out, you know, what my style is. Okay, very nice. Now, um, this second time through, uh, how long did that did that take you? Was that, because uh, I mean, we're in, we're in 2018 now, you got it in 2016, October. So I guess, because uh, I know you, let me ask this, because I know you got interested in Forex. So where along all this did Forex pop into the equation for you? <laughs> Um, that was probably around August, I, I think, August, J July or August, maybe. Um, I know it was over the summer, but like I said, I, you know, I haven't gone all the way back through all of the CTU courses because some of the things, options and advanced options, I'm not really focused on right now. But I'm, I, I'm mainly looked at. I keep looking at RVR and and shorting, trying to learn the the, the strategies that you show in there. Uh, and so it was probably around July or August. I was I was walking my dog. And so usually I'll listen to a podcast or something, but I just pulled up the Forex course on my phone, uh, oddly enough, just to kind of have some background noise. And as I started going through the, through the videos, the, the, more I, the more I watched it, I was like, I, I, I realized that with Forex, I could control my risk so much more than, than with the futures. Um, you know, because e even, you know, say a, 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 on a crude chart, I mean, it's that that's ten dollars a tick, and if I'm risking, you know, eight to ten ticks every time, I mean, that's a hundred dollars every time, and I just I, I wasn't comfortable with it. So once I started to realize that I could control my risk with forex, that's kind of where I was, you know, I, I basically made the once I finished that course, I basically made the decision that day to close down my futures account and transfer all that money over to, to a forex account. Awesome! I did not. You didn't tell me that, right? Yeah, I feel like I've never, I didn't know you were walking your dog and that's where you eventually uh, heard about Forex. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, the, the, the weirdest places we kind of stumble across, hey, that, that, makes a lot, that makes a whole lot of sense. So you, out walking your dog. Now, the Forex, you know, adventure starts and uh, I mean, you, I'm assuming you, you, you paper traded it for a while or I guess kind of just pick it up from there. You make the decision that you wanted to do Forex where did things lead from that point? <clears throat> well, that's the thing. Um, so, so I start the forex, and I'm going through the courses, and I start to say, you know, I, you know, I'm like, okay, I, you know, I like this this panic buy strategy. I like this, uh, you know, disgruntled short, you know, what, whatever the strategy may be. And so, I, I would set up a chart, and I would look for those setups. And so, basically, what I would do is I would go through and I have like a little uh, risk risk reward calculator on my platform. And so I would get to a point and I would say, okay, th there, there's a setup. I, you know, here, here's where I would want to enter. 
Here's my stop. Here's my target. And so basically my paper trading, I would kind of go through and, you know, if it would hit my target, I'd put a green arrow, hit my stop. I put a red arrow and just kind of go through. And and really what I was doing was just more so trying to train my eye to recognize those setups. You know what I mean? Um, Right. And and the thing is um, that that's kind of how my paper trading went. And I, I'm still doing that, and I still, but I, I do trade live now. Um, but it, I kind of use that as my paper trading. But I keep my risk so small, and when I say small, typically it's considerably less than one percent. I'm talking like ten cents a pip or something like that. And you know, I, I know a lot of people don't don't you know they'll they'll shake their finger at you for for knowing that you have live money in the market when you're when you're quote unquote paper trading. But for me. I keep the risk so small that the risk is, I, I don't even notice it. If, if I lose the trade, it makes no difference. But the fact that I actually have real money on the line, um, it forces me to pay attention to that trade. Because one of the downfalls that I know, like going back to when I paper traded originally with that first system, I, w- I was lying to myself, right? And so now that I can minimize that risk to such a degree that it's unnoticeable in my account when I lose, there's no way for me to lie to myself because even though the risk is that small, it's still real money and it still really comes out of my account. So it forces me to be honest with myself when I'm trading. No, that makes good sense. And what you're saying, I I kind of agree with, but it's a, it's an apples and oranges. If you were to say, hey, listen, I just, I'm brand new. I watch some YouTube videos and I'm just gonna go with live money because I, I can't pay attention and I wanna you know, treat this right. So here we go, I would say no, that's, first off, you don't even know what to practice, and second off, I mean, you don't even, when you don't know what to practice, you don't even know how to monitor your risk in a logical way. And that's not what Mike's saying. Mike knows what to practice because he has invested into his education, and because he has invested into his education, he knows how to monitor risk and manipulate risk in a sense where, like he said, even if he takes a loss, it's like, okay, whatever, it doesn't even matter because his risk is so uh, well managed because he actually knows how to do all that. It all goes back to the saying, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect, and you first need to know how to practice even if that includes real money, before you start using real money. So just the whole justification thing of, well, I'm new, I wanna use real money, but I'll just use a small amount of money. That, that doesn't do anything, because all you're gonna do is form bad habits if you don't even know what you should be practicing. Now, my one observation here, though, is, um, and just so I can understand better, but you say you're keeping your risk super, super tight. So does that mean you're getting cheap shot at all the time, or does that just mean that you're using such small position size that even if you know a logical stop loss gets hit, it's still just right. nothing? Right, yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, I, I, I keep my position size so small that it'll, it'll, it now allows me to actually listen to the chart and, and, and do what the chart is telling me to do rather than you know jump out early or take profits too early. So for example, you know, if the chart says, hey, your risk needs to be 50 pips, that's fine. I just, you know, I'll increase or decrease my position size based on, you know, what, what my logical stop loss needs to be. Oh, man, Mike, that's tears. That's tears. I love how you are letting your risk dictate everything else. And where is the risk dictation coming from? The chart. That's how you do it, folks. Let the chart tell you what the risk should be, and then you take that, and then you determine what your mental you know, fortitude is for that risk, and then from that you can manipulate the share size, or in uh, you know, Mike's case with Forex, the, the, the position size. Down, oh, that's good stuff. Re- rewind that back, re-listen to that. that, that's how you do it. Uh, all right, well that's good. I wanted to make sure that you weren't just uh, throwing out these tiny, you know, these illogical tight stop losses and then getting cheap shotted out all the time, because that wouldn't be you know, an accurate representation of what you're trying to accomplish. But what you just said there, perfect, man, perfect. So um, with the real money, I guess, how often are you trading? Because it's very evident that you are in no rush, which is great, but how often do you actually put on real money trades? Um, let, let's just take it on a week, on an average week, you know, how many uh, actual real money trades would you put on? Um, I would say probably three, maybe four. Uh and, and, and I, I'm working on that as well because I trade mostly off of a four-hour chart, um, but I, I'm I'm also looking at 60-minute and daily charts uh, because and, and this is 
most likely due to a, a bad habit that I developed, or, or or it may just be my my natural state. But after going from trading a 250 tick chart and seeing that thing fly all over the place, tra- trading <laughs> right. a four hour chart is is a huge difference. It's like watching paint dry. But I do, I do like the longer time frames because I don't have to be in such a rush to make a plan, or, or you know, and I have a full time job, so if I have a four hour chart. I can check it at nine. I can check it at one. I don't have to be on top of it all the time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So that that's, was a perfect segue into my next question. It sounds like you are uh, not quite a, I don't know, what, what would you call yourself, a, a longer-term day trader or a shorter-term swing trader? I don't know. <laughs> um, most, most, of the, most of the positions that I've had on recently, they may last until the next day. Uh, but I've never had anything go two or three days. I won't hold anything. You know, I, I won't trade on Friday because I don't want to get stuck holding over the weekend, things like that. Um, and 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 again, I mean, I'm not, I'm I'm not pigeonholing myself into trading the, the four hour chart only. It's you know, I, like I said, I've been looking at the at the one hour and the and the daily to see how they kind of act, and you know, so it's it's kind of a learning process. I'm seeing what works for me in my current situation. Uh, and just kind of feeling it out from there, looking at different the different strategies, you know, testing them on the different time frames just to see how they feel and how they work and, and things like that. So in other words, you're you're working on your multiple time frame analysis. I mean, you're not gonna be solely focused on the four hour. You're trying to bring in the sixty minute and the daily, which is just that's just good practice because you wanna get uh a few different, you know, time frames and angles to keep an eye on thing. And I, I guess I don't know what Yeah, you're you're probably like either Look at it either way, a long-term day trader or a short-term swing trader for your, you know, at most holding for two to three days. Um, and, you know, at, 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 I mean, do you do a lot of your trades? Are you in and out in the same day or is it usually at least a, a one-night hold? Um, it, it, it's hard to say, really, because, I mean, sometimes they'll, they'll roll over to the next day. Sometimes they'll close that night. It just depends on how the market's moving. Um, I, I, honestly, I, I would say probably 50-50. Um, it, but it, it, it never goes okay. to, you know, so I'll, I'll put a trade on at say nine o'clock in the morning. I've never had it roll over till about, you know, 10 o'clock the next night or anything. If I put it on at 9am, it's usually, it's usually out by, by, you know, I'm either stopped out or hit my target or, or one of my targets, you know, by the end, by the end of the night. Okay. All right. So that, no, that's, that's a good answer. So, I mean, you are definitely not looking to be, you know, in and out within, you know, 15 minutes or like myself in and out with the, within a minute. Uh, but you're also not looking to hold on for you know uh, multiple weeks or anything like that. And yeah, like you said, I mean, at some time, at, at some points, it's like, well, I don't know. It just depends on the market and what the chart's doing, and that that could dictate. And that's yeah, that's just how the market works. And you have been, how long have you been up to to doing this current strategy? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I would. I, I feel like it's been at least a few months, hasn't well, it? Well, that's the thing. It's not. It's not a one particular strategy. Like I said, I've looked at the panic buy and. I, I sorry, sorry. I mean, just the strategy of forex trading with real oh, money, oh. I, and and where you're trying to fine oh, tune yeah. things. Um, yeah, pro- probably. I would say late December, late late November, late December. Because um, one of my goals for this year was, I want to put on, you know, I, I want to try to put on a trade every day. If 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 the chart tells, I, I don't want to force a trade, but I want to try to put on a trade every day uh, just just one but that just to get in the habit of you know actually trading and putting money on the line because like I said going back I was so shell-shocked from losing initially that I mean I was I, I couldn't I couldn't pull the trigger on any trade even if it was perfect you know so I just I want to I want to get where I'm comfortable putting money on the line as as small amount as that may be I want to get comfortable where where I'm putting money on the line every day and I'm feeling that risk every single day you know yeah. Okay. No, that that makes good sense, and that's what I was gonna think. From when I knew you started trading with real money on forex, I, I could have sworn it had been a, a couple of months. So yeah, originally poorly worded question on my part. Now, as far as do you have any favorite pairs you like to trade? Uh, and also to kind of piggyback that question, because you do have a full time job, and a lot of listeners, I'm assuming, have jobs, and that's kind of one of the nice things about forex is there there's markets all over the place where you can trade pretty much any time period. So I mean, walk us through kind of the logistics of trading forex with a full time job. Uh, well, the way I have it set up is I, is is I've got I don't know twenty something pairs on there. I don't trade all of them. What what I do is I, is I have the major pairs kind of at the front. I've got tabs on the bottom of my 
chart where I could just click a tab and go to euro, dollar, you know, pound, dollar, whatever. And so I've got the got the major pairs kind of at the front, and, and I always check those to see, you know, if anything's lining up, and you know, I, I'll I'll map out support and resistance on say the daily, and then I'll drop down and maybe map some out on the four hour, and then maybe I take a look at the hourly and see if anything you know lines up there with the four hour or the daily. Um, so so pretty much the major pairs, and it, it you know as it's it's kind of like as the day progresses, sometimes the spread will will widen. So you know, at nine o'clock in the morning, the spread may be one and a half pips. And then, you know, at 1030 at night or 11 o'clock at night when volume is lower, it may be eight pips sometimes. You never know. Um, so I like to try to, you know, catch them earlier in the day when the spread is smaller. And that way I'm not, you know, I'm not 10 pips behind the eight ball the second I put a trade on. Right, right. So, I mean, it's, uh, and obviously you work at a job where you're able to to check your computer. Are you doing anything late at night or anything? I mean, are you not, or are you pretty much, you know, does your trading end essentially right around when you're done uh, with with your normal job, or are you doing trading where you might be? It might be 10 p.m. Eastern time, and you're you're no, nah, I, I don't trade. put any trades on that late because, like, like I said, it just it seems like the spreads are usually too wide for me to want to want to fool with it. Now at night, I mean, I'll go through it and I'll map things out that that I'll you know that I'm looking for the next day. Uh, but as far as putting actual trades on. You know, like I said, once once it hits about five o'clock or so, I'm pretty much done. Um, but I've, I've I've got a pretty good job, so I can you know I have my laptop there and it's connected to my, my my platform and all, and I can trade from right there. And then I work from home a couple of days a week, so I can sit right here at my computer and do what I need to do. Okay, yeah, I was I, I don't know the schedules off the top of my head, but I know some currencies are opening up when you know you know, at 5 p.m., 6 p.m., whatever those times are. So I wasn't sure if you were hopping into those ones when it would be technically early in the day for those pairs. Um, but it sounds like, yeah, you're just, you're not even bothering with any of those that may be, you know, getting started for the day later on because you have other stuff you're going to spend your time doing and you're just doing your homework. So excellent, good. That makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. And I always enjoy hearing how people uh, factor in, you know, they're trading with their full-time jobs. And I don't know where the time went, but um, yeah, we're gonna have to start to wrap things up. But as far as uh, I always like to ask this, um, loss wise, it sounds it sounded like not it sounded like it, it it was a case of when you were doing that forex or not the forex system, the future system that was just way too much risk. You really struggled with those losses. But how how has losses kind of mentally changed from you know when you were first getting started to now when you're taking losses? Yeah, we know that they're, they're they're small, but mentally, I mean, how do you deal with them and how do you just, you know, keep on plugging away? Because a lot of times a loss, no matter how small, mentally can make, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I'm a failure. I'm not doing something right. So, I mean, how has your mental landscape changed as far as losses are concerned from, you know, back during the futures to, you know, now what you're currently working well, on? Well, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I still don't like them. Uh, I get irritated because I was wrong. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. Uh, I mean, that's the name of the game is to make money. So who wants to lose? Right. Um, I mean, I still don't like them and I get irritated just because I'm wrong. And I'm like, where did I screw up my analysis? And a lot of times I'll look back and I'm like, you know, I didn't screw up my analysis. I was just wrong. And, and that's, you know, that's just one of the things you got to accept and just kind of, it's just the cost of doing business. You know, I mean, if you're running a restaurant, you got to buy food, dishes, pay employees. So, I mean, when you take a loss, that's just the kind of cost of doing business so you just got to kind of learn to accept it and just outside looking in with that comment I, i'd say that's a great step in, in the right direction where because a lot of people they will say oh i took a loss i i gotta go back and i gotta figure out what i did wrong and then they like start creating stuff or like oh yeah yep that's what i did wrong but no you said sometimes now you realize that you go back and you didn't do anything wrong everything was right as far as a setup it just didn't work out and that's the market. Mike is not sitting here. I'm not sitting here saying that there's some holy grail system out there where when every little thing is right, it is for sure going to work out. For sure does not exist in the markets. Sometimes it just doesn't work. There is no such thing as a perfect system, and that includes charts, which is what Mike and I are using. Charts, yeah, they can work out a lot of times, but sometimes, you know, the, the only answer is, you know what, it just didn't work out. It wasn't anything I did. It's just the market being the market and always reminding us that there is no such thing as a guarantee. So I mean that's uh that's some good stuff there. And I'm glad you I'm glad you said that because that that's always a big something that I always listen for 
And I'm like, all right, let's measure somebody's growth as a trader, where they stand in their journey. And you realizing that is definitely a, a big step in the right direction. Now, finally, let's talk about, I don't know what shit, I like you, so let's start, what are some things that you wanna work on? You know, some things that maybe you'd call a shortcoming that you know you can get better at. I don't really wanna use the word weakness, but you know, what are some, I'm gonna use it anyways, weaknesses uh, that you are aware of and that you know you gotta get better with? I would say focus. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm in the chat room some, but I don't stay in there all day um, because I find that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like a, you know, a psycho dog just chasing the laser around a living room. Like I'll see something, I'm like, I'm like, oh, hey, there's crypto or hey, there's options or, you know, hey, somebody's having success with this. So I, I'm aware enough to know that that I just need to kind of focus on one thing and stay in my lane. And I, I still struggle with that. Um, now, now I'm, I've narrowed it down to Forex, but now it's like, okay, what strategies do I want to use? And so it's kind of test and learn, test and learn, you know, um, and patience. Um, not that I'm in a hurry to, to get rich or quit my job. It's, it's none of that. Just, you know, I, I get impatient when, when my, my analysis is wrong or, or when I lose a trade, like I said, and I, I, I want to, I want to see that the, the, the strategies I'm using and the trades I'm making, I want to see that they're working off, working out more often than not. And I want to see those results quickly. And I've just got to realize that relatively speaking, I'm still kind of new and, you know, it's it's okay that I'm not a great trader right now, you know. Yeah, always the the one of the cruel catch twenty twos of the market. It takes ambition to succeed. You're clearly an ambitious person, but the downside of ambition is, well, you want to succeed. Why am I? I want to succeed like really bad. I'm ambitious, and it just takes time. So, ah, uh, the market and its cruel personality. And then, what are some things that you think uh, you do well? So, what are some of your strengths? And I'm just gonna I'm gonna give you one strength. You're very self-aware now. I mean, listing all those things that you want to work on, especially the whole kind of chasing shiny objects. Um, you you are aware that you tend to do that. Um, and now that you're at Forex, you know, okay, now we need to stay at Forex. So I will say one of your strengths is very clearly um, your your self-awareness in regards to you know many of those attributes. But what are some things that you that you feel good about in terms of your your trading and kind of your approach to all of this? Um. This may sound kind of counterintuitive to the to the focus comment, but I would say I'm pretty disciplined. Um, when I when I when I make a plan for a trade, I define my risk, I define my target, and that's it. If I lose, I lose. If I win, I win. That's great. Um, so, for example, what I'll do is is when I set up a plan, I, I I start off with a one to one risk to reward, and if it hits my first target, I take off half my position, move up to break even, and then I'll set a second target, and Sometimes, you know, what that's another thing I'm working on is, is, is it more profitable when I hit my second target? Should I trail it? So just kind of one of those learning things. But, um, you know, again, going back to the risk is I, I just I, I don't make those foolish decisions anymore. I don't jump out early. I don't take profits too early. So when I put the trade on, and I, I define my risk and, and my reward. That's that's what it is. And it doesn't change it. You know, a, a scalp doesn't turn into a day trade, into a swing trade, into investment for me. It's just <laughs> once it's all, on, that's it, you know. I that's uh I laugh but I just laugh because I see that all the time and and ha heck I just did a a video on YouTube um where I talk about you know how do you blow up a, you know how, how does account destruction begin and it just begins forming those bad habits where there I use an example from YouTube where somebody's you know the, the one day is telling me how it's a day trade and there's their stop loss and then literally the next day they're commenting on the same post saying well it went through my stop loss but you know, I think there's more catalysts to come, so now I'm going to be a long-term investor on it. I'm just thinking, but just yesterday you were telling me you're a day trader, and yet, so I mean, it's out there. So I'm I'm glad to hear that you just stick with the original plan. So, um, yeah, are you coming to the webinar tonight? Uh, yeah, I should be on there. All right, good. Because uh, for a little context, we're doing this uh, on a Tuesday night, and Tuesday nights are when our Clay Trader University live webinars are at. And that starts in, let's see, I'm not a mathematical genius, about 22 minutes. So I really have no choice to extend this out because I, I gotta, you know, we gotta keep moving anyways. But uh, I'm definitely gonna have to have you back. You would come back, right? Absolutely. Good, good. You know what's coming though, right? Before I, before I let you go. Because you've listened it. to pretty much every podcast. You ready for the fun questions? Let's do it. Let's do it. What is your favorite movie? And I know you're gonna hate me. I'm 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 not 
a huge movie guy anymore. My wife and I kind of watch more television series. And so, oh, well, I, what's your favorite television series? We can well, roll with that. Well, well, I, I came up with a movie for you because I was thinking, I was like, what's, I don't know that I have a favorite movie, but if, if it's, if a movie is on TV, am I going to stop and watch it? If I, even if I've seen it a hundred times, let me guess, two- let me guess. Cause I feel like this movie's on all the time. Can I guess real quick? Go for it. Shawshank Redemption. No, but that that's a good one. I do I do love Shawshank. Right, I just Redemption. feel like that one's always on TV, but so I thought high what, probability guess. Anyways, yeah, what, what I was thinking my is, part. Yeah, what I was thinking is, you know, if it's on TV and I will I stop and watch it. And I'm I'm a sucker for one-liners. And so two of my favorite movies to to that 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 I use lines from are Big Lebowski and Pulp Fiction. I love both of them. Yeah, I I've, I've seen both. I'm not enough for me to be a, a quoting expert, but uh yeah, I feel like those are movies where people aren't going to look at you and be like, wait, what? Those, those seem like good kind of hearty American class. Big Lebowski, that's more of a cult classic. Yeah, though, would, yeah, that's probably yeah. more of a cult classic, but everybody knows Pulp Fiction. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right, well, you can't tease me with the, the, the TV series stuff, so what's a TV series that you and your wife, uh, <clears throat> maybe not necessarily your favorite one, but just one that you've enjoyed? Um, we like comedies. I like to watch Scrubs, um, Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and then uh, Arrested Development, The Office, stuff like that. And then on, on the more serious side, stuff like uh, um, Breaking Bad. And then uh, I'm a big fan of documentaries. So anytime there's like a docuseries on Netflix, I'm I'm all in. Nice, nice. Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Hooch recommended that to me like a year ago that I got to watch that. And you just brought it up. So apparently that that's a, a, a good show to watch. So yeah. I'm slacking. I got to get on that one. What about, you're down in Louisiana, right? I'm actually in Atlanta. I was born and raised in Louisiana, but I live in Atlanta now. So I'm in, I'm in, I'm in enemy territory. I'm a Saints fan. So I got all these Falcon fans around me. Yeah. You got to keep your head down. But, uh, so I guess down in Atlanta then, what do you, what's your favorite food? <sighs> yeah. Again, man, just picking one favorite's tough. Um, I like anything that my wife or my granny makes. Uh, but if I'm cooking, it's going to be on the grill. I'm going to make a, uh, I like to grill wings and then I'll mix up some sauce and kind of take them hot off the grill and toss them in a the sauce and then bake them in the oven for a couple of minutes. Uh, and then, you know, just good old steak and baked potato with some grilled vegetables. And I want, I want my baked potato loaded with sour cream. None of that, none of that yogurt nonsense. Oh, what do you, have you tried it? <laughs> what a cheap shot. Have you tried it? I, I, I haven't, I haven't, I'll be honest. I, you should you should honestly try it. I mean, I'll be the first to admit sour cream is a pretty dominant thing, but I you got to at least try it once. I <laughs> was uh, uh, that was a good I, one. Well played on your part. Well I'll, played. I'll, I'm, yeah, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. I was gonna mess with you and say I like to eat guac and chick parm and stuff like that because I know that. Oh uh, yeah, don't you even. Years. You said it anyways. You said it in <laughs> passive. I should end this right now. You just <laughs> pressing the buttons. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, it's deserved. It's. Uh, that's what I get for, for airing my pet peeves as people can use them against me. So it's my own fault. But, uh, finally, uh, no, 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 we'll do two more. What about hobbies? What do you like to do for fun outside the, uh, outside the markets? Um, if, if I'm sitting here at the house by myself, I'll, I'll, you know, play some video games and stuff like that. Um, and then other than that, man, just hanging with the wife and kids, just try to spend as much time with them as I can, you know, just, I mean, that's, that's kind of the whole reason I want to do this is to, you know, begin by creating passive income and hopefully, you know, replace my income and maybe one day, you know, not have to go into an office anymore and, you know, be able to do more stuff with my family, things like that. So just right. Play, How know. many kids do you have? Uh, got two and got another one due in May. Oh, yeah. nice. Congrats. Yeah, I Did I know that? I I don't know. Should I have known that? Did you make that announcement in the chat chat room? Uh, I, I didn't really announce it. I just kind of, you know, say it Set in passing. Pa- okay. Yeah. So I got a six year old yeah. girl and a three year old boy and you know, so I'll go jump on a trampoline with them and I'll take them bike riding into the playgrounds and all that kind of stuff. Play play heroes with my son and Barbies with my daughter. Yeah, I know how that goes. Isn't it isn't it amazing though the difference between boys and girls? Like just how they act and stuff? Like it's, that's what I'm It's crazy. Really starting to realize after I got my boy after two girls and then, you know, a fourth girl, but it's like Dude, trip. What do you think? Like, <laughs> did that seem like a good idea to jump off of that? And um, now you have a big. Well, yeah. It's just. Do you have you noticed the same thing? There's a difference, right? Oh yeah, that, that, yeah. <laughs> to, to to relate it to trading, little little boys have a much higher risk tolerance than than the girls. <laughs> <laughs> well played, because that's yeah. 
That was a good analogy because that's extremely accurate. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, well said. Well, finally, man, we could keep going, but literally T-minus 15 minutes now before the webinar. But three words, these three words need to be associated with what you would uh, as, you know, consider a successful trader, what it takes to be a successful trader. So what would these three words be? Well, going back to my, um, you know, what, what I think is one of my weaknesses is focus. Um, I mean, if you're, if, you, if you're trying to, you know, chase, chase every type of instrument and make every single trade you see and implement every single strategy on day one, it's just not going to work out. I found the, the slower I go and, you know, I heard a saying in a, in a book that I read called The One Thing. It's if you, if you chase two rabbits, you'll, you won't catch either one. And so if you just kind of slow down, focus on one thing at a time, learn which, you know, learn how to trade, then learn what you want to trade, then learn the strategy. And then you can, and I think you even told me just take it slow and you, you, you know, before you know it, you'll have multiple strategies that strategies that you're able to implement in your trading. So uh, I think focus is one. Um, and I would say uh, simplify or simplicity or simple or whatever word you want to use. But at least in my simplicity is good. Yes, at least in my experience, the the easier you the the easier your system is or your strategy is or or, or you know the easier you make it, the easier it's going to be. So when you you know you don't want to start off trading saying you know, I'm going to take Fibonacci reversals at the 38% level on a Tuesday when the moon's out and I'm standing on my left, you know, the, the more, the, the more stuff you <laughs> imp implement to it, the more difficult it's going to be to, 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 to really, you know, to really get going. Um, you know, so, so to me, simplicity is one. Um, and the main one to me would be risk. Um, cause if, if your risk is too much, it's just not going to, I don't care how good your system is. I don't care how much money you have. If you're putting on too much risk for you to feel mentally and emotionally comfortable with it, you're going to make stupid decisions in your trading. Boom. I fully agree. And also on the risk, just to add in, you have to be willing to even take risk in the first place. So, I mean, if that's something where you, that's not your cup of tea, then, hey, there, there's no, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, you were like the most of the population. You were like, yeah, yeah, that, that whole, that's, I'm not, that's not my type of risk that I want to deal with and learn how to deal with. And that's uh, totally that's totally fine to the general population. But uh, yeah, Mike, that was good. Three good words and a great, great discussion here. And uh, you already said that you would come back. So I'm definitely going to hold you to it. And with that, um, you said you're going to probably be on the webinar. So I guess I'll see you in about 13-ish minutes. But uh, Mike, in all seriousness, uh, thank you for being a valuable member to the community. And thank you for always... Uh, Offering up some good comedy, and it's fun. Been fun to see uh, to grow and get better, and keep on keeping on, keeping on. So that's good stuff. And uh, thank you for taking time out of your evening. Thank you, sir. Same to you. All right, and we will definitely have him back. Before you go, listeners, the final few things. If you are listening to this on the website itself, claytrader.com, the show notes page, make sure you click that share button. You can leave comments down below. We will read those and reply to them. If you are listening on YouTube, make sure to check out the rest of the channel. There's lots of other videos and such, live trade videos, tip videos, case study videos. Uh, there's a vlog. There's all sorts of stuff, so make sure you check out the channel as a whole. But be sure to like this button, like this button, click the like button, and then go and hopefully decide to subscribe to the channel. And then finally, if you are listening on iTunes or any of the other podcast players, make sure to subscribe. And especially on iTunes, if you could leave us uh, a good solid ranking that helps us out quite a bit. It gets our name out there. And it's one of those things where if you never spend a dime on the site, that's totally fine. But if uh, you know you want us to keep making these, uh, a review like that really does go a long way. So thank you to all of you as viewers. Thank you again to Mike. I will see you back next week. This has been the Stock Trading Reality Podcast. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com.